you for uh, joining me. Uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, this cleverly worded uh, topic, how open source software gives commercial vendors the power to protect niche interests. Uh, we didn't have time to wordsmith that down to five words, uh, but it tells you what I'm going to talk about. Um, I am the uh, co-founder, chief technologist of uh, ChartIQ. We are a company that builds uh, financial technology software, primarily in the HTML5 space. Uh, I'm going to start this talk by talking a little bit about my career uh, and how I got to the point where open source was relevant and important uh, to what we do. Um, and then that'll lead to some insights that I hope to uh, convey to you. Uh, I've spent my entire career in financial technology as a uh, technologist, a programmer. Um, <clears throat> but my career can roughly be broken into two parts. The first part was uh, with a company called Automated Financial Systems that I co-founded. Uh, and we were sort of, uh, we came out of the, the dot-com boom, that uh, supernova that spun off uh, a million companies. Uh, and we, we built financial technology software, online trading systems. And uh, that company was eventually bought by SunGuard, now FIS. Um, they bought it in 2006, worked for SunGuard for a couple of years, and then I decided uh, I needed to take a break. So in 2008, uh, I, uh, I, stopped, I stopped coding. Uh, I did a bunch of things. I, I had a, a few children. Uh, I grew organic tomatoes, thus the, uh, the picture here. Um, I, I decided I had a, a nice uh, plot of land in Virginia where I lived, and I, I felt really um, bad about not uh, using uh, that property to do anything. So I'm like, I'm going to grow some tomatoes. Uh, and uh, over one summer, I sold tomatoes at the uh, farmer's market. I sold $225 worth of tomatoes the entire summer, um, which may not sound like a lot until you consider that tomatoes cost about 25 cents each uh, and that I was only probably able to move about 20% of the tomatoes I, I grew. Um, that summer taught me more about customers than the previous 12 years uh, in fintech. Um, in 2000 and around 2011, 2012, uh, my friends intervened with this situation. Um, they didn't like the fact that I wasn't writing software. Uh, the first intervention was when I got a package in the mail uh, and it came, contained this thing. Um, I didn't know what it was. I hadn't really been paying attention. I started going like this with it, trying to make it work. Um, I looked inside, there was a note uh, from my friend who said, hey, this thing came out, it's changing the world, you need to get your head out of the garden. So okay, I'll take a look at this. The next thing, I kept up a correspondence with a, a former colleague from SunGuard, a, a fellow architect, uh, and he had you know, been telling me, telling me about this thing called HTML5. I was like, whatever, HTML 1, 2, 3, 4, who paid attention to that? He says, no, this is all different. They, you can do anything now. He says, remember when you tried to build stock charts with DOM elements and like they were too slow? There's this thing called the HTML5 canvas. I was like, all right, I kind of registered. This is a, a, what I call my golden age email. This is a little bit later where I realized that uh, we were in a golden age of software. These are things that we had railed about in 2008. Uh, we, we didn't want to use relational databases. Uh, and they were gone. The value pairs uh, stores, Redis and Mongo had appeared. Um, I, I hated dealing with server racks, and all of a sudden everything was in the cloud. JSON had killed the WSDL. Oh. Um, JavaScript I could run on the server. I didn't have to switch back and forth between C++ or Java and JavaScript. Uh, and then dynamic web apps had uh, replaced uh, GUI apps uh, almost. Um, Mike's response was, thank God we never had to grok a WSDL for real. Um, so it's a good time to get back into software. And then the last thing that happened is this, this, this guy showed up at my doorstep. Uh, Dan, who I'd known for many, many years, uh, I ad admired him, and uh, we had worked together very, very briefly. I thought he was very entrepreneurial, but for whatever reason, he decided to go corporate for like a dozen years. Um, finally, uh, one day, he had fed up with you know, his boss. Um, and said he was, he was ready to start a business. And all he wanted to do was visualization. Um, and, but he didn't have a developer. Um, and so he asked me like, what I've been doing, and so I pulled out my iPad with a HTML5 Canvas stock chart on it because I couldn't help myself. Uh, and he said, oh, that's visualization. Let's go into business selling this. So um, 
I knew where that was gonna 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 land, um, and I knew that somehow, like ten years later, I'd be standing here. Um, <clears throat> this uh, is our chart, right? So, uh, I mean, this the, the the greatest thing for us was when Yahoo Finance decided to use our charts, uh, and the software that that we wrote uh, is now uh, being used by millions and millions of people every single day. Um, this is. Uh, where I took time off to, to raise tomatoes. Uh, and you know, like the, the one lesson here is sometimes timing is more important than execution. Um, so when I got back, things had uh, changed pretty significantly in uh, software. We, we got to writing software, we got back to selling software, and then we finally got around to selling to the enterprise, uh, and I was shocked. Um, when I left in 2008, Everyone was doing Waterfall. We just named it Waterfall. You know, but prior to that, it was just called software development. Um, we, we had, my previous company had, had done Lean, right? Extreme programming. Uh, and, you know, we were kind of mocked and got some eye rolls from the enterprise when we talked about this. But here we are in 2012, and everyone has suddenly switched to Agile. They were doing Scrum. Um, couldn't believe it, uh, but it was true. When we left in 2008, it was all J2EE. That's what the enterprise was about. These big honking pieces of metal running big honking pieces of infrastructure. Um, and now it was Angular and soon to be React at the time. So uh, everything had shifted from the server over to the client um, and shifted over from you know, heavy traditional languages to JavaScript. Uh, and what, sort of the most interesting thing that had changed is that the, the status of the developer themselves had changed. When I left in 2008, we weren't still wearing ties, but essentially the developers in the enterprise were you know, sometimes the lowest ranking status people in the company. They did what they were told. Um, it was top-down management, uh, and they were off in the corner with their uh, big white boxes, uh, coding them and then smashing them when they got angry. Um, and when I got back, uh, it was a whole different scenario. The programmers had taken over the enterprise uh, and I don't know what happened, like the explosion of software just got too much uh, for you know, the, the management, and they kind of just handed over the keys to the software guys and said, here, you, know, you, you kind of run the show. And so now when we look in the enterprise, software developers are unbelievably empowered, uh, and they're often driving some of the business initiatives. The other thing that changed pretty dramatic was the role of open source uh, at the enterprise. Uh, in 2008, when I left, uh, this was what epitomized open source. Um, for those of you guys who don't know, that's Richard Stallman um, from the Free Software Foundation, whose utopian dream of socialist software threatened the very nature of capitalism. Um, Red Hat were the guys that came to the rescue by legitimizing open source uh, for the enterprise. And MySQL was one of the things that stood out as um, this glorious thing that corporations would never uh, tarnish and get involved with and the future of open source. Um, when I got back, open source was a whole different crowd, right? It was Angular, it was Chrome, it was Node. Uh, the folks that were getting involved now were the big West Coast firms. It was uh, Google, it was React. Uh, eventually, even Microsoft got into it, you know, giving us TypeScript and uh, Visual Studio Code. Um, <clears throat> so uh, open source had uh, really dramatically changed. To give you a sense of how dramatic this change was, in 2006, when we sold our company, we had used the GNU string library um, in our software. Completely kosher. It was LGPL. You could freely use it, link it into your software. But it was just too damn scary for the lawyers. Um, and so before we could sell the company, we had to spend an entire month rewriting our software to use the standard C++ string li library. Thank you, Bjorn, if you're here. Um, <clears throat> now, the typical enterprise, their portfolio, they have hundreds of applications that have hundreds of NPM dependencies. They get loaded really with not very much thought. There's some automated systems to check uh, for vulnerabilities. Um, but that's about it. Uh, the enterprise is permeated with open source. Um, the implications are generally good, right? Uh, open source is a good move. Uh, we're getting more stuff done, uh, but it's not all bed of, uh, a bed of roses. It's, at best, jumping from the fire into the frying pan. Um, <clears throat> so to think about like, what 
the benefits of open source are. Uh, it helps to think a little bit about um, what the, uh, how we think about uh, open source and what are the things that come to mind. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is that open source is free. Uh, and maybe this is why the enterprise is using open source. Um, but I don't think that the cost of software was really ever a significant hurdle for the enterprise. Uh, the cost of commercial license of software is, you know, uh, it's a rounding error. Uh, typically, uh, enterprises have incredible uh, buying power. Uh, it, it wasn't a cost that drove the, the companies to open source. And in fact, again, just to quote Red, you know, Red Hat, uh, we know that companies will pay an enormous amount of money for reliability and predictability. So if it's not free, then maybe it's because it's transparent, right? We used to trust commercial software because we trusted the profit motive, right? It was, it was just uh, uh, innate. Now we say we trust open source because it's transparent. We can see inside. We know what's going on. Uh, but the reality is, like, how often have you actually looked inside of your open source software to a check that is doing what you need to do to understand it? How many of your NPM dependencies have you forked? Um, the reality is that uh, we do trust open source word, uh, software, but it's kind of like a herd mentality. We trust it because everyone's using it, uh, particularly the, the, the big boys out there on the West Coast. Um, <clears throat> the shift here in trust is pretty dramatic. Uh, when, when I left in 2008, we couldn't sell software without a deep code audit. Um, and now, I, you know, I can count on one finger and half a finger how many code audits our software has, has gone through, even though it's uh, playing a really significant role in penetrating much deeper into the enterprise than anything that I had built in my previous company. So if free and transparent aren't the reasons, what is? Um, and it's, it's actually pretty straightforward. Um, Andreessen's fav famous quote, software is eating the world. Um, <clears throat> Open source has more developers writing more code, producing more value, and it's just more stuff. You know, if we go back to C++ and Java days, uh, if you needed something and the standard library couldn't accommodate it, you're off hunting for a commercial library, likely not finding it and ending up DIY DIYing it, having to do it yourself. Uh, so we were really, really slow. I mean, it took a long time to build things, and we built a lot of infrastructure, and there's a lot of redundancy from firm to firm to firm. Nowadays, if you need to do something, there's a 90% chance that it already exists. It's in JavaScript. It's instantly available. The ubiquity and instantaneousness of open source software, particularly JavaScript, is what's allowing it to eat the world. So this is all great, right? But what's the rub? And the rub is, what if your open source library doesn't do what you need it to? Uh, again, going back to commercial vendors, you could trust the profit motive. When the enterprise uh, told a commercial vendor to jump, the response was, how high? And then here's the bill. Um, getting stuff changed in the open source community is a very different endeavor. Uh, and there's a couple of ways that typically we try to go about it. So the first obvious way is, you know, fork the code. Um, it, this is just frankly a terrible idea, to fork the code. Uh, it takes an enormous amount of hubris to think that you can take someone else's software, download it, make the changes that you want to it, uh, and then have it run reliably. Like if you, know, if, if you went to Oracle and said, oh, we need Oracle to change how its transaction management works, and they said, here's the source code, go ahead. Like, would you trust that? Um, it's, it really just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, <clears throat> it takes an enormous amount of time to understand code and to safely modify it. Uh, if you add to that the fact that open source code is notorious for lack of commenting, for lack of a authoritative style, uh, it's really a major endeavor. Uh, and then, of course, once you fork the code, you have to maintain it. It's a ton of work, and then you end up losing the benefit of the community, and you have to make this decision constantly about how to re-emerge your code back in. It's just not a great idea. The next thing that you're going to try to do is you're going to try to convince the maintainers of the source code to make the changes for you. Um, and of course, you know, that's easier said than done. Your change may not be what other, people's want, uh, what other people want. Uh, it may be what they want, but the, containers just, uh, the, the maintainers don't have time to do it. Uh, more than likely, they're going to say, hey, that's a great idea. <clears throat> Can you submit a PR? And then we'll merge it in. So you're right back to square one, having to understand the code, having to write it, 
Uh, and at best now, maybe you have a, a code reviewer to, do, uh, to help you there. Um, so really, we're back in the same boat of uh, third-party software that we may need to get changed, except now I can't actually pay someone to do it. I have only my wits and charm to get that done. Uh, this is not great for the capital markets industry. And the reality is we're too busy writing software. Software is eating the world. Our developers should be working on business logic, not on infrastructure. And open source is larger infrastructure that every single firm, every single bank, every single brokerage, every single asset manager, they all need the same thing. It doesn't make sense for them to do that. Um, so this opens up the opportunity for a new type of commercial vendor. It's a vendor like our company. There are other companies here presenting that are uh, in a sort of similar domain. Uh, I think Red Hat was the original sort of pioneer in this. Uh, they took open source software, they commercialized it, um, and they made it uh, palatable for the enterprise. And if you look at any major piece of sort of infrastructural software like Kubernetes or Postgres, you're going to find commercial vendors that are supporting that software and adding value. And of course, there's instances like Mongo and Docker where the whole company is based around that model. In the case of um, <clears throat> what we're uh, supporting, it's, it's Electron. Uh, the use case that we support is what we call desktop interop. And uh, this is brand new to a large portion of the community. Uh, and if you haven't seen it before, I'm going to attempt to uh, just show you real quick this on one of these monitors here. So the first thing that it is is a different form factor. So here, I'm totally hapless with PowerPoints. Uh, you've got a browser window, but it's a tiny little thing. Uh, and we have little menus and stuff that we can click on here. So this is a, tan a brand new form factor for the browser. Whoa, I can do that. There we go. For the browser. And we're protecting this within the Electron community. This is not a standard way to deliver an Electron app. Uh, it uses frameless windows. Uh, it's uh, a completely different way of thinking about Electron software. Skype and Spotify and Visual Studio Code that are based on Electron don't have this use case. So we're in there protecting that use case through uh, lobbying and discussion and education. The second thing that we're very focused on is security. We want to be able to integrate third-party applications. The, the financial services workspace uh, involves many, many third-party applications being integrated. Um, <clears throat> Electron is not focused on this. Most, again, Spotify, Slack, Visual Studio One, they're not incorporating third-party content and applications. Uh, Electron's capable of doing it. Uh, we're there to help them uh, focus and make sure that uh, they maintain that and are focused on it. Uh, performance, right? Our use case that has multiple applications running simultaneously, again, is a novel use of uh, Electron. Um, so we're ensuring that the uh, parts of the Electron API that are uh, focused on performance are uh, maintained. Um, it's interesting that, you know, in the enterprise where you're, they're buying hardware uh, on a large scale, uh, often the performance characteristics of the machines are less than what you would have at home on your laptop. Uh, so it's a significant concern to the enterprise. And then finally, reliability and predictability. Um, <clears throat> the software that we're building is replacing software that's in Java, that's in C++. We recently replaced a Delphi system. So we're replacing code that's been in production on desktops for 10, 15, 25 years in the case of the Delphi soft software. Um, there's no reason to expect that this wave of JavaScript desktop software isn't also going to be on the desktop for 10 or 15 years. Um, that's not typically how people think about JavaScript software or building web software. It's web software is disposable. It's like a three-year cycle. Um, so this concept of building enterprise-grade JavaScript, JavaScript for the long term, is really a new thing. Uh, and it's something that we're very focused on to make sure that the longevity is there in that uh, project. So, we're doing these things. The question is, how do we go about doing that? Um, and it's helpful to start by understanding there are several different classes of open source software. The one we think about uh, most often is the individual champion. Uh, you know, a guy uh, or girl in her uh, uh, 
bedroom at night over the keyboard, building some really cool stuff. We actually have a guy working for us who built an incredible piece of software called Osmosis, totally supported by him, used by thousands and thousands of people. He doesn't need a commercial vendor to come in and help him. Um, D3 is a great example. D3 was built by uh, the fellow who was in charge of infographics for the New York Times. He built it in order to help him at his job. Became uh, ubiquitous in the industry for uh, infographics. Um, but again, it's supported by him and a small cadre of people. It's not a place where uh, uh, a commercial vendor really needs to uh, help anyone use it. Uh, corporate Overlord is the one that we're getting more used to. Uh, we've got Facebook supporting React, we've got Angular, uh, Google supporting Chromium and Angular, we've got Microsoft supporting TypeScript. You know, a few years ago, still have Oracle supporting Java. Uh, again, you know, they're, they're doing a good job, they're helping spread uh, this benefit to the world. There's not really much need for a commercial vendor to come in and add like enterprise grade React. It's already enterprise grade because it's been built by these mega companies. Uh, but there's a class where a commercial vendor really makes some sense. Uh, the one we're most familiar with is the corporate monetizer. Uh, Red Hat I talked about, uh, Redis, MySQL, Mongo, Docker. Uh, these uh, companies that are building open source software, releasing it open source, but then monetizing it. <clears throat> Another great type of open source software is the foundational overseer. FinOS here uh, is one example. I think the Apache group is the one that you know, is sort of world famous. Uh, this is a great place for a commercial vendor to get involved because it's highly structured, it's committee driven, uh, it is primarily for commercial interests. I think Apache is sort of split commercial and academic interests. Um, but it's a place where uh, corporations can come in, uh, play a role in a very structured way uh, and a very beneficial way. And then the last one, you know, I, I've kind of coined this, this corporate co-op of which Electron is one, it's sort of an oddball, but I think Linux was like this too, where <clears throat> there isn't a single corporate overlord, uh, there is no oversight by a foundation, it is literally uh, cooperative of several companies who have an interest in this, working as peers uh, to support the software. Uh, and this is a place where uh, a commercial vendor like ours can play a major role in making sure that our customers have a voice in what's going on there. And even a small company like ourselves can in, uh, uh, represent an entire industry that is just as relevant as Google or Slack uh, who are in there and using it. Um, <clears throat> so working in open source, the first thing you need to understand is that it's social. Uh, every open source project is a community of individuals. Uh, projects have cultures, they have hierarchy, they have rules that are spoken and unspoken. They have processes. They have needs and weaknesses. So it's important to understand how to behave in the open source community in order to be effective. Uh, the first sort of surprising thing to uh, a lot of folks is that altruism actually prevails. Uh, the greater good is the main driver of most open source software, even the ones with corporate, over corporate overlords. Uh, and I think this is because developers are cooperative by nature. Uh, we're driven by the need to improve, not the need to compete. Um, so, uh, you know, generally, you know, when you get into the open source community, you, you leave your competitive instincts at the door. Uh, credibility is essential, right? If you want to get the uh, attention of the maintainers and get their assistance, you have to be asking informed questions. You have to demonstrate an understanding of the project. Um, you, it's okay to bring a view uh, in fact, use cases and industry views are, are welcome uh, in uh, open source projects. Uh, legitimate use cases are highly valued, uh, and companies can participate if the scope is right, but they have to demonstrate that they're not just in there to, you know, wham, bam, I want to get a change, and then they're out. And then finally, social capital is currency in open source. Uh, open source projects are hierarchical by nature, uh, but that hierarchy is based on participation, so it's very fluid. Um, those who contribute the most, care the most, are given the most authority and responsibility. Um, when you think about it, uh, spending your time working on open source, even if it's for a company, is sort of an inheritably charitable exercise. Uh, and I think in those sort of altruistic communities, uh, a great deal of respect is given to those who contribute the most. So 
you know, the way that a company can act as a good partner is simply to match the goals of open source itself. If you think about open source contributors, the thing that most motivates them is bringing their vision to life. They want to see their code out there being used, helping people, uh, changing lives, uh, and being a part of the everyday, everyday world. Uh, and then the second thing is permanence. There's, uh, I wrote a little open source back in like 1993, and I was so surprised to find my comments in iOS code in like 2010. It had just hopped around you know, over and over and over again. Uh, and there's a really great sense when you experience that sort of permanence, and I think uh, that's something that they're all after. So we dedicate time, we dedicate knowledge, we dedicate commitment, uh, and we dedicate involvement. But back to, you know, what's the question, right? Open source, shouldn't it be free? It's, it's here we are saying, well, you want to pay a commercial vendor, whether it's Red Hat, whether it's uh, Charter Q, Ensemble, um, <clears throat> shouldn't it be free? Well, there's an elephant in the room about open source, which is who's paying for these developers? Developers are extraordinarily expensive. Uh, and the reality is if you look at almost any open source project, the developers are being paid by the corporations that make use of the open source software uh, in order to maintain it. Uh, there are some cases of where developers are working their spare time, but it's a minority. Uh, but if we go back to you know, the original premise, the reason the enterprise is using open source software is not because it's free. They're using it to get more value. We move it to f move faster. We move it to eat the world. Uh, so for industry-specific problems, for critical infrastructure, uh, in order to achieve that sort of security and longevity, it's rational to use a commercial vendor, uh, and it's rational uh, to pay for that support uh, and then for that longevity and to bridge the gaps uh, where they're necessary. So for our industry, uh, we essentially are representing a family within a larger group in the open source community. Uh, we're developing deep knowledge about the open source software. We're talking their language. We talk our customers' language. We help translate that. Uh, we bring use cases uh, in both directions. We help our customers understand the pros and cons of what they're doing uh, with the software, what the trade-offs are, uh, and we, frankly, just help them make good decisions. Uh, of course, we lobby for our customers' use cases. Uh, that's the most critical thing that we're doing, making sure that they're supported uh, and understood. Uh, and then finally, we contribute. Uh, we're ensuring the continuity of the program, uh, and we provide a bridge in case of uh, eventual divergence, so a little bit of that security. Um, in the end, you know, open source is all about community. Uh, and I think it, uh, this with FinOS, with the, the increasing dependence on open source, uh, there's also an increasing interdependence between companies and vendors. Uh, it's becoming less and less hierarchical. We know that when we're working with companies, we're working directly with the developers there. We're creating relationships, much like the relationships that we're creating in the open source community. Um, and ultimately, it's, it's, it's good for everybody. Uh, that sense of community is raising awareness about what code needs to be built, uh, the value of the, that the customers are bringing, the value the vendors are bringing, the value that the open source projects are bringing. Uh, and in the end, we're building more software more quickly and really making the lives of our end users uh, much better. So this is uh, uh, our company as of, uh, I think it was February or March, a little bit bigger than that, but um, <clears throat> this is what it's all about. So I would like to thank everyone for participating. <laughs>